entered our vocabulary. Meltdown. What would later evoke fears of a hole burning to China was first seen with no particular alarm at Walter Zinn's experimental breeder reactor. It happened while the scientists studied the effects of increasing power. Kirby Whittam was a junior scientist working on the reactor. The experiment turned out to be an increase in power for two or three hundred seconds. At that point, it actually showed a tendency to gain reactivity by itself. Operator in charge said, take it down. The power dropped, so everybody thought, well, that's normal. But they sat there and watched. The power came back up. It was a response that the operator hadn't seen before, nobody's seen, so they decided to watch it a while. Well, it kept going up and going up. This was like maybe for 50 seconds. And finally, it took off on a pretty steep curve and it tripped on its own safeties. Melted down the core? Well, there was a small section of the core, probably about that big, that was melted out of a core this size. After the experiment, the highly radioactive damaged core was shipped to Argonne's laboratory in Chicago. Here, scientists discovered that when the metallic fuel they used got hot, the chain reaction increased, and even under normal operations, the fuel swelled and broke through its metal casing. The problem became a major stumbling block for almost 25 years, until Dr. Till's team would solve it in the late 70s. The swelling was due to a phenomenon that would, in fact, only cause the fuel to swell a certain amount. After that, it would stop. And so that your fundamental discovery was that if you allowed clearance within the casing of the fuel for it to swell, that you would, in fact, solve that particular problem. It was a simple solution, but very important, to give the fuel room for expansion. With this discovery would come the answers for Till's reactor of the future allowing the use of plutonium and uranium in metal form. No conventional nuclear plants would use it, but for argon, it was critical to the issues of safety and waste. It had taken them nearly 25 years to come up with the answer. But while they worked perfecting various kinds of reactors, a crucial turning point came when another option was promoted by the military. At Groton, Connecticut, a new naval era dawns with the launching of the Nautilus, one of the largest submarines ever built, and the first atomic-powered craft in history. It was understood early on that of all the uses of nuclear power, one of the best would be for the propulsion of submarines. The historic moment is in hand. The launching cradle is released, and as the Nautilus slides down the ways, Mrs. Eisenhower christens it with a valiant blow. At once a formidable fighting ship and a forerunner of commercial atomic power, the Nautilus heralds a new era of the atomic age. The man chosen to direct the program was Admiral Hyman Rickover, a forceful personality, who chose not a breeder, but a conventional water-cooled reactor for the submarines. Rickover was so successful in building the most effective strike force the U.S. had for the Cold War that utility companies interested in building the first commercial nuclear power plants jumped on his lead. In December 1957, the first commercial plant generated electricity in Shippingport, Pennsylvania. It was modeled after the submarine-style reactor supported by Admiral Rickover. It became the standard for U.S. commercial plants. And in the years following shipping ports, orders for nuclear power plants began to roll in. In 1963, three plants were ordered. In 1966, 20. A bandwagon began to roll. The Grand Canyon, an unlikely spot for mining. And yet on its south rim lies the Orphan Mine first developed as a copper mine, now part of the current uranium boom in our western states, created by peacetime uses for nuclear energy. Some of the nation's largest power companies are among the uranium prospectors, 
as they map plans for future nuclear installations replacing oil and coal burning plants. Actors were hired to sell the new product. There's nothing mysterious about an atomic power plant. Basically, we're just using a new heat source. In the early 70s, 100 nuclear power plants were ordered in just three years. Historian Richard Rhodes has chronicled the nuclear age. It seems to have been a classic technological fad in the United States. We jumped in, local utilities jumped in. It became something that one utilities president would brag about to his pal over golf, as I've heard from more than one of these people. We've got one of those new nuclear reactors to make our electricity, Joe. How about you? World peace was threatened by the most critical period in history since the end of the war. Red puppet Castro and the Russians turned Cuba into an island fortress. The wall of shame in Berlin was one year old. The civilized world cried shame when East German guards shot a fleeing teenager and then left him to die. Meanwhile, in the 60s, for those using atoms for war, this was also a boom time, as the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union dominated the world. Half century of Soviet rule is observed with a military parade through Red Square. The occasion is marked by the unveiling of five new missiles shown to the general public for the first time. At weapons plants like Hanford, production reached its peak. New methods were developed so that the radioactive material could be handled safely. But there was another story emerging from Hanford in the 1960s that Hanford's growing problem of radioactive waste could be a source for the isotope being tried for the treatment of diseases like cancer. It was evidence that even at the height of the arms race, atoms for peace remained a high priority. When President Kennedy came to Hanford in 1963 for the dedication of a new reactor, the message was again about the peaceful promise of this new technology. As is well known here at Hanford, we must hasten the development of low-cost atomic power. I think we should lead the world in this. Our experts estimate that half of all electric energy generated in the United States will come from nuclear. And I think it's very appropriate that we come here, where so much has been done to build the military strength of the United States, and to find a chance to strike a blow for peace, to find a chance to strike a blow for a better life for our fellow citizens. At Argonne's reactor testing site in Idaho, they were preparing for the future Kennedy described. They continued to have faith that the real potential for nuclear energy lay in the unlimited power of a breeder reactor. By the early 1960s, the first experimental breeder had been retired, and a second larger breeder reactor was under construction. It would later serve as the pilot plant for their final answer, the integral fast reactor. What was the spirit here in the 1960s? In the 60s, it, there was a lot of excitement. Construction was going on. We who were hired to uh, operate these new machines were mostly in our early 20s. Uh, so it was, it was fun and interesting. So compared with the space program, for instance, this was Cape Canaveral. Yes. By that time, Walter Zinn had moved on from Argonne, and Charles Till came to work at the lab with the idea of building the next generation of nuclear power plants. The goal was to build a reactor that would solve the problems that were just beginning to plague the commercial nuclear industry. One of the biggest would become the issue of nuclear waste, a vulnerable point for the nuclear power industry and one that puts its supporters on the defensive. It's odd because the waste from fossil fuel plants goes up the chimney and we breathe it. 30,000 people die every year in the United States from one disease that is directly caused by air pollution from coal and fossil fuel powered utilities. But it is nuclear waste that frightens the public most. And as more and more irradiated fuel was stockpiled in underwater reservoirs, 
the vision of tons of radioactive materials lingering for thousands of years sent a chilling picture to the public. And so the scientists at Argonne set out to solve the problem of nuclear waste. Their idea was to recycle the waste and burn it in the integral fast reactor. The key was the metal fuel. It allowed them to use a simple technique similar to electroplating other metals. The waste is placed in a basket and lowered into a vat of molten salt where electricity is flowing. As in the electroplating process, the uranium and plutonium migrate across to another electrode, leaving behind a smaller quantity of shorter-lived radioactive waste. This material, the uranium and plutonium, can be reused in the IFR. Till imagined a situation, envisioned a situation, where you would have a reactor complex safely away from cities, perhaps, and it would take in a starter load of fuel, and it would recycle that fuel over 40 or 50 years until it was essentially ash. And you wouldn't have to deal with burying nuclear waste. And you would be, in fact, burning plutonium, which is something that we are probably going to need to do someday rather than just bury it in the ground. And what we're going to do is update this table here. Today, Argonne scientists like Sean Cunningham are working to improve this recycling process. We have a chance to, to do something with the, with the fuel that uh, not too many people in the country are actually doing anything besides doing studies on how we can store it long term. In this facility, we're actually trying to do something to, uh, to change its form so that it's not quite as hazardous to the environment. And I, find, I personally find that exciting. To answer concerns that the recycled fuel could be stolen and used to build bombs, the scientists deliberately kept the separated plutonium mixed with other highly radioactive materials, making it unusable for weapons, but perfectly suited as fuel in the IFR. Nancy Bonomo is an engineer with Argonne. Is this as good as it sounds? I think it's wonderful. I, I really uh, am excited about this process because nuclear power is needed. We only have limited sources of fuel in the world, very limited sources. Nuclear power, if you look at it compared to other sources of power, it's much more plentiful, and in reality, it's more safe. But a lot of people don't want nuclear power. They're afraid well, of it. Well, that's because and all of our other sources are plentiful. they can't get plentiful. rid of the waste. At this point, our sources are plentiful. But we can get rid of the waste. We're doing it. That's what this does. Yeah. That's what I thought they were saying. For Charles Till, the recycling process was critical to the successful development of his reactor. He could get rid of most of the waste. But there was one question left, the most important. Was his integral fast reactor safe? About 400 determined Long Island residents arrived in the nation's capital around noon today. They hope Congress will listen to their rallying cry, a cry of people power, not nuclear power. In the 1970s, the public was losing confidence in the safety of nuclear power plants, as fear spread across the country that something could go wrong. I'm really very concerned, and I don't understand why they, you know, why they want to go for opening that plan because it's like almost like suicide there's no other place that i would be today but here doing what i can to protest this 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 this, this nothing short of a of a, an attempted rape of long island and then there was three mile island could i hear attention please there has been a state of emergency declared on three mile on March 28, 1979, the flow of water was accidentally shut off to a reactor at the Three Mile Island Power Plant in Pennsylvania. Through a series of operator errors and malfunctions, the core lost coolant. Part of it melted down. Eventually, some radioactive material was released into the atmosphere. At Argonne, Charles Till and his team watched Three Mile Island and learned from it. They were determined to show that with improvements in their technology, Three Mile Island would never happen again. So far, breeder reactors had done badly. A demonstration plant near Detroit had a partial meltdown. A proposal to construct a breeder at Clinch River, Tennessee, became prohibitively expensive and was